It's a great pleasure for Mike and I to welcome into the studio James Gay Reese, the BAFTA, Emmy, and Academy Award winning executive producer. Netflix and Formula One just said, Do you guys want to do it? So we jumped at it. Oh, that is timing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that that is, is it timing. was good. It was a good thing. And the rule of these shows, which is really hard for people to accept, but it's sort of once they've done it once, they kind of, the penny does drop, is that if you're going to do an access show, do it completely. Everyone seems to be realising the power that it can have for a sport. Some of the players who kind of put their hand up and said, I'm really happy to go there with my story. And he just humanises these guys. It just makes them come off the page, you know, yeah. and in a way that needs to happen. Yeah, I really think it shows a sign of rugby that people just don't know at all. Hello, Dream Team. Welcome along to this week's episode of The Good, The Bad and The Rugby in partnership with our very good friends at Continental Tyres after the madness of May last week. Now for something a little bit different because it's a great pleasure for Mike and I to welcome into the studio James Gay Reese, the BAFTA, Emmy and Academy Award winning executive producer. We don't get many people yeah, in our studio yeah, with titles talent, as impressive ta ta as talented <laughs> as that. Um, nice to have you with us. We're going to talk Netflix documentary and specifically the, the, the kind of the, the Six Nations bonanza that is now uh, ready, ready to roll. But you, you said as you walked in, actually, you've, you've got a hell of a day of it. We've got the Netflix premiere tonight. You've been doing something with Tour de France today. You're in here today. I mean, life is where on the sort of speedometer at the moment for you at the moment? It's always a crazy time of year, Christmas. So anyway, thank you for having me, by the way, first and foremost. Very, very but, um, welcome. Yeah, because we always finish Dry to Survive over Christmas, so I never really get much of a break over Christmas. So we finished it last night, I think, episode 10 in the edit. And so as you say, today is uh, Six Nations and I had some friends in from Paris, Netflix today on Tour de France. So yeah, it is, it's it's pretty relentless, but um, it's that classic cliche, isn't it? You've got to make hay while the sun shines and get on with it. That's quite an impressive opening salvo, Dry yeah. to Survive, Tour de France and Six Nations and uh, on the CV is has, quite something. Has that been, uh, well, and also congratulations getting the dress memo. We've all, yes. got, we've all we've got We've come identical. We've come straight uh, out of the yeah, yeah, we literally have. Um, did everyone come to you with Drive to Survive and then off the back of it, does, has everyone... Oh, we need that because obviously there's, you know, the likes of Breakpoint, there's yep. the likes of uh, Full Swing, there's obviously now we're going to have full contact with the Six Nations and, and everything else. Everyone seems to be realizing the power that it can have for a sport. So, has it been everyone knocking on your door or have you had to? Of it being you pushing the other way. Yeah, it's been a bit of both. I mean, the way it started was that I made that film seven years ago and then I was at a CAA sports event and I met the Red Bull marketing team, Formula One team. And they said, we really want to do a documentary. We've been thinking about it for ages. Got this great team principal called Christian Horner. will do pretty much anything, you know, he's very producible. And so we then did actually pitch it to Formula One and they'd just been bought by Liberty. And I didn't know that they were already in conversation with Netflix about doing the whole thing. So they just, Netflix and Formula One just said, do you guys want to do it? So we jumped at it. Oh, that is timing. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that is, is It timing. was good. It was a good thing. And I'd never made a 10 part series before. So it was a big learning curve. And then that show obviously landed and um, it landed quite big, quite quickly. And so pretty quickly uh, conversations around other sports did kick in and they're still ongoing. We're doing horse racing, we're doing 100 meter sprinting, we're doing looking at sumo, uh, we're doing MLS. So there's lots of things on the horizon as well. Maybe a few more in America. World of sumo would be yeah, yeah. It will be fascinating could be I, couldn't it I, I do some stuff with a, a japanese company and we had a guy explain all about sumo to us and it's absolutely fascinating mm. coming uh, to a screen there you soon yeah hopefully just very i just want to add this because it's, it's just worth mentioning your company is box to box films you've made the new documentary six nations full contact which we've mentioned which is the story of the 2023 tournament as was um you're also behind drive to survive as you've mentioned which had an enormous impact on the popularity of F1 and the template for which has been followed by golf, tennis and cycling on Netflix. In terms of rugby, first of all, always just interested when people come on this show. Have you got an interest? Did you play? Is it alien, new, no, no. fresh? No, What's I'm a big fan. I played till school level yep. right in London. And um, What position? Hooker, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. I mean, wrong shape entirely. I've yeah. needed a knee replacement as a result yep. from you know being yeah. too tall. and <laughs> you did well to get out of there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I you know, remember I went to university and I went for the trials for the, uh, in that first year and suddenly it was just like it'd gone from boys to men, do you know what I mean? It was yeah. just like very big, hairy, scary men. So I backed out of that quite sensibly. But um, And I played at London Welsh when I was a kid for a little bit and stuff. So now I'm a real, I'm a massive Wales fan, I have to right. confess, because my grandfather was... That was, was the good, the bad, the yeah. right. It's been lovely <laughs> to have you with us. So we ended it. 
no, that's been a then. It was tricky there because I grew up in uh, Richmond and Twickenham. So we actually had, my dad used to have debentures at Twickenham, but it was like going into the devil's lair every yeah. weekend. So it wasn't a particularly... Old Deer know, Park. Yeah. Yeah. We used to get um, hammered by England all the time in those days. But uh, I grew up on that, you know, I'm just, I'm just old enough to remember the kind of glory Welsh days. Yeah. So that was my learning curve. And um, yeah, so followed Wales through thick and thin and, and the Lions, obviously. Um, so yeah, no, to, to do this, obviously, therefore, was a bit of a dream project. So th that's interesting, because I was going to say, in your sort of, your top 10, where does rugby sit? Would it be one, two, three, four? I mean, this was a, a so, real opportunity. Yeah. I've got two passions, basically Welsh rugby and Liverpool. Okay. So that's red. that's pretty me. Red and red. Red and red. Yeah. Red and red. Red and red. Do you yeah. know, I'd love to do it at this point because I know that there have been sort of little bits leaked online, etc. But if you haven't seen it and you haven't watched it, here is a little glimpse at the Netflix trailer for Full Contact. So what's it like being golden balls? <laughs> Six Nations is the tournament to decide the best team in Europe. Rugby is prime. It's doggy dog. When you go off to a game... I'm not going to no, be at war. I feel like you are going off to war sometimes. Embrace the fear. Embrace it all. They've got some of the best players in the world rugby. And that's what you want to play against. You want to silence them in front of their home crowd. Two helping bowlers and foot. I need to see more energy off you, because we are the better team. The thing is, we probably need to go through a bit more pain. You like the challenge, don't you? I struggle with mental health for years. I'm not afraid to say it. You think it's a thing that you don't have to do the most football? When you feel like you are an imposter or you shouldn't be where you are, that's when you start questioning yourself. Responsibility not only to my teammates, to myself, but all the people that have been there for me. This could be the last chance winning a trophy in the Six Nations. We just need to make this one count. It's business ultimately. And there can only be one winner. So that is the trailer for the new Netflix documentary all around the Six Nations called Full Contact. Rugby hasn't had many red carpet days of late. In fact, it's had very few. Did you pitch the idea to the Six Nations? Did the Six Nations knock on your door? How did, how did the, the concept for Full Contact come about? It's a good question. I mean, actually, I've been sort of trying to do something with rugby for a long time. We got really close with the England team World Cup before last and actually had a sort of deal in place with one of the streamers but then it sort of fell apart for reasons above my head um and so then i sort of know will carly a bit and we've been talking on and off for a while and then he sort of i think he introduced us to the six nations sort of uh guys and girls and um yeah there was an appetite they, we got into netflix at the right time and obviously they what they like about it i think is the fact that it's very european focused obviously yeah and Netflix is very local markets focused. Obviously, they want things to play globally, but they also want them to be very local facing as well. So the, uh, it's quite neat in a way, because if you can find something which really does work in the UK, France and Italy, then that's quite a good catch for those guys. So, yeah, it kind of, you know, it adds up on some level for them. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, we just, you know, it took a long time to get it all together, as it invariably does. We were going to do the year before last, but uh, it didn't happen in time. So, you know, we finally managed to get it away this year. It would have been fascinating if you'd been at 2019. Well, we had a good time socially, but uh, obviously how England's success would have been. Because it was, I think, if I remember rightly, it was going to be mainly just focused on England, wasn't it? It was, yeah, just pure England. And obviously, as you say, they went all, all the way to the final, so it would have been an incredible access situation. But Find yeah. out what went on behind, whether the bus actually was late, yeah. the coin toss with Sia. There's so much I want answers for. But mm. in some ways... That is a sort of microcosm of rugby right now, which is there's an amazing opportunity, there's an amazing story where there could have been a whole additional level and yet rugby somehow manages to shut the door on that. So when the conversation began, did you find it a very receptive audience that you were talking to? Was there a real can-do attitude and we'll open everything up? Or have you had to navigate a maze the like of which you've not had to see in other sports? 
They're all challenging, to be honest with you. I mean, you know, it's um, what invariably happens is that the the marketing officers and the you know the heads of these organisations organisations can see the value in it if it works correctly to increase their profile. But when you get into the nitty gritty of the management and the players, they have a different point of view because they're rightly concerned with performance and they're yeah. like, well, "This is just a pain in the ass. It's going to get in the way," you know, and you know, how's it actually going to work? So. You get a lot of momentum, then it suddenly stops. And that applies to a Formula One team, a rugby team, you know, a surfer. It doesn't really matter. Um, and so you've got to spend a lot of time explaining the process. And the rule of these shows, which is really hard for people to accept, but it's sort of, once they've done it once, they kind of, the penny does drop, is that if you're going to do an access show, do it completely. Yeah. If you're in and out of a team environment, it's really it's really, really disruptive and it pisses everybody off. We don't get what we need. It does kind of, you know, uh, distract people. If you're allowed to embed properly, consistently, then everybody's happy because you then you become part of the furniture and they get used to you. So, but it's hard to convince people to take that leap of faith and just say, yes, right, come into everything. Right. Um, so that's always the challenge. But um, they're all incredibly hard to make. I re really, really wish they were a lot easier, but they're not. Right. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a frustratingly difficult process but you know when it clicks and you get those great moments of real access which really tell a story it's worth all the aggravation but do you generally see people back back off as they they get used to it because because i think well you can correct me if i'm wrong like drive to survive you started with the the teams that were more struggling weren't they it was like you know, okay you can go work with them and they'll give you access because they they need to keep their sponsors happy everything else and then when it, that first season went and it was successful suddenly did you have other people going okay you know it worked that first season yeah we'll open up our drivers we'll open up our doors a little bit more is that generally how it always works so did you find that did you find that rugby was guarded in this first year and if there's a season two you feel that it'll be opened up a bit more well, you're right because try to survive season one there's no mercedes or ferrari then i think the mercedes guys or probably both of them saw the effect it had on the advertising budgets and all that jazz. So um, <laughs> money always talks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably some reality in that, isn't it? And then um, yeah. So I mean, listen. In our first season of uh, the Six Nations show, there were definitely some teams which were more approachable, and they probably had slightly less to lose in their own minds. So you know, the bigger can we, teams. Can we put names on those or not? No. Probably better if I don't. Yeah, but I mean, uh, the bigger teams generally are more reluctant. Yeah. And the smaller nations are kind of like, well, you know, why not? Yeah. Um, and I think it's actually what's been really encouraging is that in the sort of uh, debrief meetings we've had with some of the unions and some of those bigger teams face to face with you know the key people they seem to there's been a bit of a sea change and they're like okay we've been through it once we understand now yeah. and they haven't seen any data yet so it's not like there's been an uplift yet it's just that they you know hopefully there's going to be a season two and they're like okay we'll, we'll try and do try to bring more to the party i've yes. been hearing that players agents have already been in touch that if there's a season two they'll a few you, more players you, you, are ready to put their names forward which is great you which say should. hopefully you've got about 10 days to get season two signed off haven't you or is that well netflix always did this thing whereby um because you have to start production before the show launches otherwise you don't get your run of material right so they do like a, a small bridge and then you know they wait for the data and then you get a second season or you don't so it's, it's 2024 are you in with the teams in 2024 is we, that... we started now but oh like you have a, started yeah. okay okay yeah. got you um one of the things that I remember Warren Gatlin saying when this was announced, there was great excitement amongst all of the fans. This is going to be incredible. But there was, have you you've touched on already, a bit of reticence around the teams. He said rugby challenges its athletes, perhaps in ways that other sports don't. It, it really demands an emotional commitment, whereas perhaps F1 is about keeping cool in the heat of the moment type thing. When you look at the ingredients that you need to make a properly sort of hot property. What what has rugby got that the others don't? And, and what does it need more of, if you know what I mean? I think what's been really interesting, I mean, I, I sort of think I know a bit about the game, but obviously I've never been truly on the inside at this level at all. But I think what was interesting was just, um, and one of the challenges, I guess, is that because when you're dealing with team sports, it's about the collective, right? And, you know, those coaches are like, you know, you are, you're a team in, every, in the best sense of the word and you've got to play for each other and cover each other, whatever it may be, as opposed to individual sports like golf or, I mean, Formula One sort of an individual sport at the end of the day. And so I think that the challenge is basically not breaking that team collective, but getting players to stand up and say, I'm happy yeah. to feature in this and at, without disrupting the team collective. But also I think, getting inside that team mentality is really, really fascinating. And I think that to your point, you know, 
I don't think people have any idea what it's like to play rugby at international level. Somebody once described playing the All Blacks as like being in a car crash. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What it does to your body. And I think that that psychological state you have to get into to play rugby and the tension and the kind of anxiety around that, I mean, I just think is unique. And we try to get into a little bit of that in the show. And I think that the other thing is that I think more than maybe other sports, rugby has suffered over the years from sort of like rugger bugger image, right? And beer swilling guys and this bloke us all that. And actually... Some of the characters in the series, you know, they're very open about whether it's mental health or whatever it might be. And you realise they're just, you know, just like everybody else. But And it's even more extraordinary, given some of their vulnerabilities, that they then can go on and do that. Do yeah. you know what I mean? They're not just these kind of like, you know, these, you know, these uh, sort of unbreakable, you know, robots. You know, they've got their own issues. And because it is so physical and it requires such commitment. So I think that's a little bit of the insight we get. That's a, that is definitely a shift. That is a shift, though. If you go back to what probably made living with the Lions in '97 work was, you know, you saw everything from what goes on in a team room, but then, you know, to a scrummaging session that ends up in a full, full-on dust-up, and you're like, hang yeah. on, they fight their own, their own mates. And I was like, well, that's just, that's how it is. It's, you know, and it sort of brings in people. Always think that players can make these these rational decisions in split seconds whilst the emotions are so high. And they will never go, fall on the wrong side of it, or punch someone, or you know, make you know, tackle might ride up, or you know, you'll lose your cool. But that's how physical the game is, and I think that's that's the side that people will never understand unless they played it to a really high level. Because you know, it's not the same playing it at grassroots level. It's your same in your own little domain. But you know, when you put under the spotlight of eighty-five thousand people, twelve cameras, and 10 million people well. on television. Yeah. yeah, 10 million people on television. It's it's uh, it's way different. And to get yourself in the right place to go out there and do it, you know, not everyone can do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Once you started picking at the scene of the storytelling, were you surprised? Was it on a par with what you were expecting? Were you blown away by the the narratives that unfolded and the opportunities that presented themselves? Yeah, we were. Like like I said, some of the players, you know, and I don't want to kind of spoil it, you know, for people not seeing it, but some of the players who kind of put their hand up and said, I'm really happy to go there with my story. You know, it's very brave. And listen, you know, I'm always amazed that anybody wants to be involved in any of these shows because it's like, you know, it is exposing. And I think that one of the key uh, episodes is around Porter for Ireland. And you can see that given some of his issues, how being a part of that collective is really, really make him feel like he belonged to yeah. something that gave him a kind of bit of security that maybe didn't have in other areas of his life. So, yeah, listen, it's, um, I, I just want to, I'm really hopeful we can move it away from that stereotype because, you know, I was even telling my girlfriend about it last night of coming down to this thing. She's in Sussex, she couldn't come tonight. So I don't really like rugby. I'm like, yeah, but you haven't given it a chance yet because yeah. you don't really understand it. You just, you're assuming it's just that and it's not just and, that. And she doesn't like it because of, that perception. Well, see, she's not really into sport. At all. Okay, right. she's, not, she's never watched a single episode of Drive to Survive. It's fine. Do you know what I mean? So, okay, yeah. but um, Health, healthy relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In some ways, yeah. R rather like our wives than this. I think it's yeah, yeah. sort of it's, this is the man cave that we all escape to because no one else is. Yeah, very interested in it. We, I, I it's it's funny. I uh, this is a problem we always talk about with rugby is because it's so team orientated and we always yeah you know, we have this you know tall poppy syndrome where. Yeah. We don't really, in football, one player can hold the team together, yeah. pretty much. You know, you can have a Messi, you can have a Ronaldo, you can have, you know, uh, an unbelievable goal scorer who can, who can, who can win you games. Whereas in rugby, you can have great individual players, but they can't win you a game. They can, they can try, they can score you wonder tries, but generally, if the, if the other, if four of the other players don't play to their best ability, there's a good chance you'll lose. And, and I think what rugby has a problem with is going. You can still embrace those characters and allow them to go off and do I watched Johnny Manziel uh, I want That's Johnny amazing. Football's documentary about you know him and you know he could go out he could get wasted the night before go out and play and he'd play the best game I think he played uh, whether he played Michigan or something he had the best game that he'd ever played and he was he was stinking of booze the morning after. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's where rugby needs to be able to adapt is that people can still play and be down to earth, but let them go off and be whoever they want to be and be quirky and be like Johnny May. Johnny May last week spent the whole time saying how he just didn't want ever to be, no one to speak about him because he just wanted to do everything right. Yeah. Uh, never wanted to, it, it was more, I don't want to be noticed. Unless I'm playing, unless I'm playing and I'm scoring tries, that's where I want to be noticed. And I think we need to get out of that. But yeah, well, we have one episode which is about Finn Russell. 
He's but so good. Yeah, he's so, so good. good. And also, you know, but it, it's really about that tension between him just saying, I just need to express myself and Gregor saying, yeah, but just do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, oversimplifying, obviously, but it's about that push and pull between somebody who's naturally an extrovert and somebody who's trying to generate and kind of inculcate that team mentality. So that little tension, but it, it's a really good episode, actually, because it, they sort of come together. Wait, just going back to... The, the point you made about your girlfriend and her lack of interest in rugby. And I suppose that there's sort of two layers to this. But when you go into other sports, as you do, right into the very fabric of it, f- fabric of it with F1 and tennis, etc. and cycling, do, do, do you think rugby suffers a little bit from an, an identity crisis? And I put that on the layers of the players and then the wider perception. When you compare it to F1, where everyone knows exactly what the sport is and it's very into the detail, does rugby suffer a little bit from being able to shout about and celebrate a really clear identity? Maybe a little bit. I mean, I think that if you think about Formula One, uh, tennis and golf, for example, mm. maybe not all of the others, but those three, they sort of imply some sort of lifestyle component. You know, Formula One's sexy, it's international, it's bling, it's fast, it's pretty. Playboys, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, golf, it's money, it's private jets, it's sunshine, it's Florida. Tennis is even pretty glamorous. I mean, tennis is actually pretty, it's, been, it's a real grind. It's yeah, a it's yeah. difficult, dark it's world. if you're outside yeah. of the top. Yeah, and they, they all, they, they're all challenged mentally because, you know, they all process loss every week. Do you know I, what I mean? Uh, that was the, that was, uh, blew me away, that one, how much they can talk themselves into losing. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it was it was just incredible. I right. was like, how can you have that mentality? But I suppose if you sat there and you're just exposed, there's only you. And yeah, exactly. And you you just sat like, there for two minutes in between each, you know, yeah. every yeah. third the game, demons. and you just, oh my god, I played rubbish in that game. And, and you can work it out. Though. Yeah, yeah. No caddy, nothing, nobody in your corner. So I think rugby, you know, without sort of making it sound superficial, doesn't have that slightly more. Lifestyle's the wrong word, but do you know what I mean? And that yes. sort of accessibility, which makes it broader yep. than some of the other sports that we're dealing with, maybe. And I think, you know, we haven't gone out of our way to try to develop that because I'm not sure how you do that. But I think that part of it is just opening up these players who tend to be young, cool, good looking guys and just saying, listen, I've got a really cool girlfriend. We're going to do this tomorrow, you know, X, Y, Z, and make them more rounded in terms of the optics, yeah. I guess, you know. It, it might be an unanswerable question, and I'm not sure you possibly have stopped to think about it but can you see a solution to that i mean you mentioned the rugger bugger thing which i think possibly is is much more of an external perception on the game than probably for those within it now oh, for i think, sure. I think yeah. it's moved on quite cons- considerably from there but that is still how people when you say rugby and they've not watched it would would probably project the sport can you think of easy wins that the sport can make from your position where you're comparing and contrasting in the way that you are we think that Dry to Survive is basically a soap opera, right? So you've got this kind of soap opera in this paddock that travels around the world. You know, where everybody's going to be standing every weekend and they've all worked for each other. They've all fired each other. They've all pissed each other off. But they all get on their private jets and piss off again. So it's just that, that heightened sort of environment. I think that with rugby, what we'd like to do with season two, if we get a chance, is to kind of go more into the players' lives and see their worlds a bit, see their backstories, where they've come from, what they do when they're not playing rugby and just get to understand them more as characters. Because at the moment, if it's just training, rugby pitch, yeah. changing room, do you know what I mean? That's yep. quite that's quite narrow. Yeah. Even though, even you know, seeing the change room scenes for me, it's completely compelling because again, you just never get that reality. And you know, training's training. Sometimes it's really insightful. Sometimes it's not. But just to open it up, and we you know on the few occasions where we do go into the players' lives, you know, they're really candid, and actually, you go, okay, I get it now. You know, this is this is it's bigger than what I thought it was. You know. Did you have a favourite? Rugby player. As in who came forward and, and gave you something or a story. I mean, you mentioned Andrew Porter. But... Porter's great. Genja's great. Finn's great. I mean, you know, the big personalities yeah. for a reason. But I mean, no, you know, some, there's lots of really good people in it. And um, I just think Genja's great because he just, you know, he just goes there. Yeah. You not know. afraid. Of no, not no. at all. We always like to, we've thrown this open actually because a number of our viewers and listeners will be very interested. We, we talk about this a lot about how rugby is projecting itself about how it needs to make a bit more of the amazing narratives that it has so we always throw it open for questions and our continental question of the week this week which i thought was a really interesting one is from ali hall 21 who said how much editing power did the teams get is there a a, a, ref, a right of refusal or do you say if you sign here we're telling the story how we want to tell the story all these shows have a review process, which is really clearly defined in terms of what they can review. So in Formula One, it's meant to be, 
you know, uh, engine IP or whatever it might be, or right. design IP or something. Truthfully, you get people saying, look a bit fat in that shot. Please, please take it out. Do you know what I mean? So it really is, it really uh, is the vanity. It is of a little F1. bit, uh, it becomes a bit of a sort of give and take. You say, listen, yeah. you can have Surely that. you can edit that though. Can you not take 20 pounds off the cheeks? <laughs> AI. Yeah. But um, so, no, there's a very sort of strict, delineated review process. Um, and to, rugby teams, I mean, to my surprise, are kind of, I mean, they obviously are very protective of their IP, even though I don't think audiences are particularly interested in line-out calls or, yeah. you know, attack patterns, wherever it might be. So we did, you know, we have to uh, nod to that. But no, they're pretty reasonable. I mean, it wasn't a particularly uh, painful process, I have to say, because we don't really focus on the stuff they're worried about. Right. You know, that's interesting. I, the, the other thing I was going to ask, uh, I suppose, is is whether there are people that you've touched on and met in this process that you would love to feature more of have you got a kind of a wish list for series two is that is that have you got all the, the featured players locked in for series two or is that do they doing that right out? now you're doing that now. yeah so i mean you want some of them to return and you want some fresh blood basically right. so you want to get that blend yeah and obviously the um reality with these shows is that you film a lot more than you're ever going to need sadly so some players are filmed and they're not featured but jump by and large you try to put as many flies on the water as you can that you think are kind of good bets yeah and then you know editing is a funny process you guys probably know you know what you think is a banker ends up running out of road and what you think is a nothing story ends up blowing up yeah so you need options basically in the edit um and uh yeah i mean you start i mean season one you start pretty wide and then we'll try and hone it down season two and season three if we get that far and in terms of we've done a number of shows actually we did a show after the rugby world cup final about who is rugby's biggest superstar right mm. now when you compare the characters, obviously we're talking about the, the, the many layers and depths to, to the personalities, but, but when you actually just compare the sort of the X factor, do, do you see rugby lagging behind a number of these other sports because of the essence of team first at all times? I don't know, you know, I mean, you know, we, I can only speak for the players that we actually directly, you know, worked with on this series. I'm sure that there are lots of very charismatic people in every team. Yeah. They just didn't put their hand up. And, you know, they've got to put their hand up. We can't force somebody to do the show. But, you know, we have an episode um, around Gail Foucault and he's a bit of a rock star. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? He's got, he's a charisma, charismatic guy who, can, you know, definitely has a key role in that team and he's a great player and he's yeah. been there for a while now. So, you know, he's definitely got star quality. Do you know what I mean? So you can see him, you can see why he's where he's at. Uh, so no, I think, listen, I think the characters are there. I think they just need a platform to kind of express themselves if if they want to, you know. Which sport has the biggest prima donnas? Not oh, football. Right. We okay. haven't done anything. I've, done, I've made films about Maradona and Gerard and stuff and Ronaldo. So, you know, Maradona and Ronaldo clearly not exactly shrinking characters. <laughs> Gerard is a bit more complicated. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's, uh, and, that's... And how does that sort of come out in the documentary? Do you find yourself sort of not in a battle necessarily with the subject matter that you're trying to portray or, or do they give all, access all areas and you just film the, the chaos that surrounds them? What, footballers? Yes. Well, it depends because Maradona was obviously an archive piece. Yes. It was looking back and Gerald, I mean, was also an archive piece, but we had access to him and, you know, in a really meaningful way. So, listen, I say that, but then, you know, I'm sure the NFL, the NBA has yeah. quite big characters in it as well, but we that's not our wheelhouse yet. Yeah. You know. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. Not to yet. Go into, to be, um, yeah. Very interesting indeed. So a couple of other quick <coughs> questions. Was there a very distinctive culture divide between the six different teams? Did you did you see very different stories within each one or is rugby sort of... In, and could you pick up who drove that within each? Is it really easy for you to walk in and see who are the main drivers, who are the core of each team and and understand what, what makes each of those teams tick. For sure. I mean, yeah, for a start, I mean, yeah, the countries themselves are very different from each other. You? Wales and Italy don't have a lot in common, do mm. they? Apart from... How many times before the Wales-England game did they say, we hate them? Did yes. They, <laughs> in, the, in the Welsh dressing room. I can imagine it was a lot. <laughs> we hate them. Yeah. Every time they come out. We beat the English, we don't care. Yeah, exactly. However, I mean, there's a lot of that, isn't there? But I think... That culture is obviously it's so often sort of defined by the coach, isn't it? And you know, you've got some pretty big characters. I mean, you know, Gatland and James was in the background going, "Yeah, we do." I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> in front I was very of camera neutral. suddenly. Yeah. Very neutral. But you know, Farrell's a big character. Gatland's a big character. They are so driving that culture, um, and they are all very different human beings. And I think that. Listen again, I'm no expert, but you can see how they observe the identity of the team, and then grab the bits they want to develop. 
and make you know really important and then you know to kind of kind of like really drill down into that so no they did all feel really different and um listen the french are impossibly french in the italian you know, do you know what i mean it's embedded in the dna the stereotypes it? really do yeah come through. i think so i tell you what james can i ask you a little bit about the impact so i've got some amazing stats here from joe pompliano which is all about the impact that drive to survive has had on F1 since it got going. So the average age of the F1 fan has dropped from 36 to 32. The 2021 US Grand Prix was the most attended F1 weekend in history, 400,000 over the course of the weekend. 70% of those fans for whom it was their first ever race, 40% of race ticket sales are made by women, which is up from 25%. And the formula stock price is up 250%. Did you get equity as part of the yeah, deal? Yeah, yeah. Did you really? I've made millions. <laughs> we're, very, we're very touched that you came to yeah, see yeah. us in this shambles then. But I get asked that question a lot. Did you? Series three? Are you, I mean, is, have you ever had that conversation around equity? If we're going to do this for you, I'd like yeah. a little slice of the pie of what we're going to do back. Maybe in like the kind of like conquer games, right, you know what okay. I mean? Nothing, in, nothing Everyone meaningful. Handing out no, options. funny enough, they're not giving me equity in Liberty Media Group. It's a, it's, it's a travesty. Right, you're very philanthropic in what you're doing, man. No, listen, but, it's but, um, yeah. I mean, listen, you know, it's that show's been transformative for us as well. So yes. you know, you have to take a everybody view, wins. You know. Did you? At what point on your journey with Drive to Survive did you start to see this kicking in and did you start to think, hang on, we are doing something here which is great for us, but this is changing the sport in front of our eyes? It was just, it was the, well, it did, it opened pretty big. I think it surprised people. I don't know why I think it was COVID, you know, yeah, it was, it was kind of maybe it was something to watch in COVID, you know, yeah. it was that sort of thing. And I don't know, the, I mean, like a lot of things in life, timing, timing was yeah. good. You know, I think that, with F1 as well, there's always... There's always the talking point. There's the Max Wing in that final race. There's the massive crash uh, with Grosjean, Grosjean mm. uh, where he gets out of that car. So there's all that is one thing that normally happens is that you you, you need those. I mean, we'll, we'll I mean we'll have that with red cards and everything else, talking points and everything else. So there's going to be that sort of side, but the jeopardy with with F1. There's always that moment that everyone jumps on. Well, you there? hope so, yeah. But I think it just seemed to grow you know, for, for whatever reason, people got into it. And, you know, you you had 18-year-old girls in LA watching a show about Formula One drivers. You know, they didn't even know it existed before. So it did achieve that ambition of getting that younger audience in. And then, you know, the Netflix, I suppose it is part of the Netflix effect. They know how to, you know, feed that audience and kind of find them and ram it down them. They're all yeah. quite good looking, though, F1 drivers, aren't they? There's, yeah. you know, there's no porters there. It's fully tattered up with <laughs> big mullets, is there? You know what I mean? <laughs> that'd, that'd be, be good. That'd be Series 5. <laughs> if you cross pollinate, shouldn't we? You get a porter in a Formula 1 car. Yeah. And get, you know, Alex Albon to drum and play rugby. Yeah. yeah. But but that is, I mean, that is really interesting. Can, can I ask what sort of impact you think full contact might have for rugby? What is your hope? in that regard or do you dare not as say as a rugby fan yeah I mean listen I mean, think listen I think dry to survive I think it's always, there's always that thing of being first right I think it just kind of like exploded and became the one that really talked about and watched and obviously there's there's more of them now so you're spread it's getting spread around a bit but I think um, if it increases the profile and widens the audience at all yeah. it's been worth doing right whether it's going to you know change the demographic in the way that um, that dry to survive did I mean you know that, that was a bit of an aberration I mean there's definitely been a big uptick in golf and, and tennis and Tour de France. So I don't see why it wouldn't, there wouldn't be a lift, but it's hard to you know predict how big it's going to be. But as I said earlier, if we can move it away from that s slight misconception that some non-rugby fans have, and they can watch it from a kind of you know more relatable point of view and just go, oh, okay, these are just inter they're interesting guys in their own right. I think there was a very interesting stat in the, I think it was an Ernst & Young report, where they said rugby is fourth in terms of engagement in the UK, but when you drop it down to Gen Z, it falls all the way down to 28th on the list of sports right. that they are engaging with. Do you think what you have created him might change that in some ways? Well, that's the ambition, isn't it? I mean, you know, as a, as a rugby fan, I'd love to see it connect with the younger audience. And I think, um, listen, I've got daughters who are 19 and 22 and getting them to connect with anything is a right. challenge. Yes. If it's not a TikTok, you yep. know. So I think that all sports are, maybe apart from the Premier League, which seems to be pretty bulletproof, all sports are doing this for a reason because they they need to kind of get into that you know generation and obviously that's what Netflix does offer you is that inc massive audience and I think what Netflix has been very smart at is that they now have banished it Netflix sports series so they're all under this banner they're creating this kind of brand if you like which I know for a fact that a lot of my daughter's friends do watch those Netflix shows. It's become a thing, yeah. you know. And you may not watch every single one of them, but it, it's pulling them into this sort of overall stable 
of these products. So, um, yeah, but I think, listen, I don't think anybody should expect miracles overnight. I think if it, if it makes a bit of an impact and we can build on that, that's yeah. the best case scenario. And then, you know, I think I saw all the Netflix people in Vegas at the Grand Prix and they were like, season three was the tipping point when that show really then took off. And then what was great about it was season five when it was that really contentious season. So it built to that mad, frothy peak yeah. and actually has stayed there, thank God. But I mean, you couldn't have scripted that season and it came down to the last lap of the last race. So, um, you know, but having said that, it's the only really good racing in the last, that's in the last seven years was that race. So yes. you don't necessarily need fireworks every single race or every single match in order to make a show which will connect with people. That's very interesting. Just following on from that though, is rugby hamstrung by how complicated it is to play, to understand, to watch, to follow? Is that is that a Well Formula One certainly is. Do you know when you think yeah. about how complicated tire the tire strategy is in yeah. Formula One, we don't go there. Right. So in the way we've treated rugby now, we try to look at the games obviously much more compact um pieces and it's through the eyes of the player we're following. Right. So you're trying to actually use the game as a payoff to the narrative as opposed to being the narrative. So that's really the trick. And by the way, you know, we always used to have this cliche when we were making center that ideally the film would work without any racing in it because you're invested in the human story. Yes. And obviously you're going to have racing, you're going to have rugby. Yeah. But it's got to service the narrative as opposed to being the main event. Because you already know the result. Yeah. yeah. You have championed this. You've actually been very on board with, the, with Full Contact and the story and the evolution of it and actually have spoken to a few players sort of before it started filming, saying this has to happen, you have to make the most of it. From your perspective as a being there, done it, why? Why is this so important? And, and what have you seen in what's coming through this that has meant you've thrown your weight behind um, it and no, helping I, where you can? Because I, I think for everything we've just, we've discussed, people d you just don't understand how complicated the game is in terms of you know, how long training takes, you know, how hard the players work to be together as a team and what how much time they spend together. And it really does become that band of brother. And if you're in a team that doesn't have that band, you just, you fail. It's without a shadow of doubt, if you don't like the guy to your left or to your right, you won't work hard. You, when the shit hits the fan, you just won't give that extra bit. And the teams that find it are the teams that will die to the guy to the left or the right. You know, the Al, Al Pacino speech, the one who will fight for the inches. Yeah. And that is what makes the, the team. And I, I just think that's the side that people need to understand and how grounded like the players are in general. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason, another reason, you know, that people aren't always out there because they just don't go out and do those sort of things. You know, you've had your Cipriani's in the past, you've had some players who, who've sort of fit there and have been shot down. Whereas I think if they were nowadays, I think it'd be very, very different. Lewis Rees Samit's quite out there and he wants to yeah. be sort of out doing stuff. And he, you know, he said to me, he wants to live in Monaco. And I'm, like, I'm not sure how that works when you, live, <laughs> when you play for Gloucester. Playing at but, Gloucester. Um, yeah, you know, so I think that there are those characters coming now and now it's down to the coaches as well, being able to deal with that. Cause for a long time, all the coaches were very old school. It was all about drilling. It was all about, whereas now that science is coming in and right ways to train, right ways to look at it, it becomes very, very professional. And hopefully we'll allow those guys to go out there because, you know, we still don't have those players that are on billboards and, we'd, uh, you know, for big brands and big stuff. And that's the next step, even though we've got an international game that, you know, 10, 12 million people watch. The Rugby World Cup was the, is in the top three sporting events on the at, planet. At, on the planet. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's been able to take that and making it a, a, a regular part of everyone's daily diet. Can I ask you a question though? Because it seems different in France a little bit in the sense of the, the profile of the players, like Dupont's a yeah. massive star in France, isn't he? Yeah. yeah it's what is it about the culture over there that allows that to happen? I, th I think because it's so, rugby's so big in certain areas of France. Um, but it's it is, in the South, it's bigger than it, football. Yeah, it's bigger than football down there. So, and then with that, that brings that passion. Whereas we are always, rugby in this country is always fighting that no one will ever get near football. And the fact over here we are still classed as a private school sport so for everyone who goes to public school who play football they just think us as a posh sport we have that real issue because yeah. if they want to engage with rugby they'll, they'll probably watch rugby league uh, up north and everything else whereas you just don't have that in france so you've just got a, a very loyal very uh tribal uh 
passionate and it becomes Regional. like yeah like a foot like a football fan you know you saw that with argentina in the w- rugby world cup when their fans come over yeah. it's that foot it's more of the football flares mentality and flags flares and having fun dancing around and uh, most of them have messy shirts on yeah. <laughs> but they're still out there watching and i think you yeah, know that's what we're missing at the moment is finding and how we ignite that sort of passion about the same thing. I suppose the because the French are pretty good at football as well, right? Their yeah. national team. But I suppose it's the it's the Premier League, isn't it, which kind of just is so all consuming. Yeah. Yes. You know, psychologically. Yeah. There was an extraordinary sort of sentiment around the fact that I think even ten years ago, Premier League was probably seventy five percent of the sporting landscape and then there was cricket ten percent, rugby ten percent and everything else in the in the following yeah. five. Whereas Premier League is probably now up to eighty five, ninety percent and everything else has had to squeeze into right that last 10, which is why rugby has had its sort of, its challenges. We, we, we touched on the sort of, the potential. But that is also why we've got to do things differently. Of course. we yeah. have to fall yeah. into. You've got to push that, back but, a little bit. But then, you know, that's that's down to agents as well, not just taking contracts, that they've got to make their brand sponsors use them in a way that, yeah. you know, with, you know, Sia, Sia, for example, and DuPont are used in very clever ways to, to actually be out in the public domain more. But we, yeah. you know, since the likes of Johnny, Dan Carter and Lomu, no one's ever been used in that way. No. And we need to sort of try and people have mm. got to take a chance and a risk on and opening the doors and letting people know what, what we're like. Um, just to get back to the impact element of it, you sort of touched on how this could impact. Do you think rugby could move quite quickly to put some of these things in place off the back of what we're going to see through through the uh, full contact of the Do you mean, or, or can you see fire extinguishers now the fuse has been lit you can see fire extinguishers coming out further down the fuse uh, i did listen i don't know i mean i think that what became pretty clear to me is that there was a general acknowledgement that you know rugby needed to get out there right and needed to kind of find a broader audience and i think that's you know as like i said earlier it's very you know it's every you know i've had a chat with a, one of the big um national coaches the other day about season two and he's like you know nobody has to tell me about what rugby needs to do, you know, I'm completely invested in it, but I've also got to try win, to win rugby matches and yeah. that is my priority. So there is that tension between it. But I think, um, listen, I think it, it can be done. I think that, but it does require a collective sort of push from everybody to try and get on board. And you just, you know, you know, you know the trainers left the station. As soon as I saw Didier Deschamps, you know, his halftime speech <coughs> in the World Cup final being aired, I'm like, well, you don't get any bigger than that. Yeah. So if he can do it, you can do it if you're a rugby coach, do you know what I mean? Or a, or a golfer or a caddy or whatever, because, you know, listen, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but in this age of, you know, content, you know, it is an arms race. Everybody's going after the same audience. And if you want to compete, you've got to open the doors. And you know, there's a good way of opening your doors and there's a bad way of opening your doors. Yeah. And that's on, it's my responsibility to make the process as pa- painless as possible. But I think it's, um, you're not going to do it if you stay under a rock. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It won't happen. Is there a person, team, or competition story within rugby outside of the Six Nations you would love to be given access to? Or oh, Wales at the World Cup. <laughs> Short documentary. That's a passion project, is it? Oh, just listen. It would just, you know, I did actually have a chat with Gatland a couple of years ago about doing something we, you know, and again, it was we were sort of talking about it. But, um, but you know, yeah, I'm mean, no, my biggest, my if I could do anything, I would do the Liverpool um, access show. But again, I don't think Jürgen's, He's been pretty vocal about not wanting to right. let cameras in. Right, interesting. It's quite yeah. strange from him. You'd think he'd, li- he'd like it. But. Well, again, he's, he's just that, it'll distract people. Yeah. Is that sort of thing. Is there anyone going back in time that you you would love to be able to rewind the clock and help tell the story of? Yeah, definitely. I mean, listen, with the sad news of JPR's death, I'd love to um, do something about him and that generation because that really was the generation I grew up on. My grandfather was from Clinetley and, you know, it was a pretty re- religious thing in our house to follow that team. And um, I definitely got hooked in that on that, those amazing days. And uh, I know rugby's changed radically since then, but there was a certain romance around that, that moment in time and those players and obviously JPR and, you know, Phil Bennett and Gareth Edwards, all those guys were complete sort of heroes to me. So... Listen, you know, it was quite a long time ago, yeah. but, it, you know, those Lions tours to New Zealand and stuff were pretty incredible. So um, I'd love to do something about those guys at some point, again, because, you know, Sid going and those sort of players, you know yeah. what I mean? It was incredible. So, yeah, it was... The, um, the comb-over. Was it a comb-over? I, <laughs> I think occasionally it caught the wind. The Mike Gibson. It? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
And, it all and, adds to the sidestep if you can send the hair one way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I suppose that we, we, we often talk about the, the sort of proper superstars. Jonah as well. Was Jonah someone that captured your imagination? Just terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine trying to tackle You probably tried to tackle him. Yeah, he ran over me and yeah. scored. Try, I tried being the operative yeah. word there. Yeah. 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 I felt honoured though. Yeah. Um, I actually thought I'd hit him really hard. But <laughs> he did just... It's like, yes, I've stopped him. And then it just rumbles on. And he just pushed me out the way and scored. I was like... Yeah. Another notch God, on the back. I thought I'd trying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll I tell you the other thing I just very quickly would ask you is why has rugby never had a proper one of these other probably than living with lions before. Why has rugby never been able to unlock itself? God, you'd have to ask other people that tried. I mean, I've only tried recently, so I couldn't. I don't know. But um, did you but watch? Do you watch Living with Lions back in the day? Yeah, I loved yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've watched it. I mean, whenever the Lions go on tour, they put it on again, don't yeah. they? And, you know, the reason um, why that succeeded was it was still amateur, so no one cared. But the right. access was amazing. The access, yeah, because no one cared. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no one was trying to protect anything. No one was worried about what people thought of the coaches. No one. No PR. It they, was just. It yeah. was basically. It was real. Yeah, and that is why. Whereas now it's all. You know, people are like, oh, you know, coaches are worried about what they say and because how they treat players, how they speak to them. People, are like, oh, you can't speak to people like that. Well, that's just what you do when you in rugby. So you haven't got, you know, it was it's that whole thing of um, of bigger bollocking George, uh, George North. North. Like you don't have time to sit there and go, excuse me, George, we have a chat. Just so we're in that situation, can you just make sure you get it off the field? You don't have that time, so it becomes out in a very aggressive way because, again, you're playing in the emotion of a heat of a battle, the way you're passionate and you care about something, and yep. you just get it done and you speak to each other all the time. People are like, oh, you can't speak to each other like that. There isn't HR in rugby. You just no. get on with it and you fucking sort it out yourself. Every Tuesday, the forwards are having a fight. So, <laughs> you know, it's, that's, the, that's the brutal truth yeah. of it. Much like this pod. With the Six Nations, Six Nations documentary that you've done, does that stand up in your view year on year as it is or can you see people talking about South Africa should join or promotion relegation should come in when you're creating something like full content are you constantly looking for new storylines or just to delve deeper into the the fabric that you've got well I've got no idea if the format will change obviously but I mean I think um no we just need to you know it's a big learning experience you know getting inside these organizations because obviously the challenge with this is like making six series at the same time fundamentally because we're embedded with each team so it'd be a lot life would be a lot simpler if I was just doing the England or the Wales series but because you're actually tracking each team all the time then weaving those narratives together is obviously is quite complicated. So we'll just try to be more efficient the way we do it next time. Um, I'm really happy with the show. I think it's really, I think it's a really good watch. Yeah, I really think it shows a side of rugby that people just don't know at all. But yeah, I mean, listen, you know, if you look at Drive to Five now compared to season one, it's improved as a show probably. Yeah. And, you know, you also get relationships with people, you know, so the access gets better uh, inevitably. It's, you know, it's a bit of a, you know, you dive into it and you have to pull a show out of it in season one. Um, and actually, I think that it's a really, really good first season. But yeah, I mean, you know, the, tr the trust with the players and the organisations will increase. And therefore, you know, that does, these shows are access driven. You know, if yeah. the access is poor, the show is going to struggle. Yeah. If you've got good access, then you, it's hard to muck it up. Have you put it in front of anyone who has no interest in rugby? Your girlfriend's obviously turned down the opportunity, but have <laughs> you, I'm interested as to whether you've done a bit of sampling for those people who've got no affinity with the sport at all and what they've made of it would you just I haven't had time to that, see. Get it out it's not because I don't want to I, mean, I don't do that with any of the shows Yeah. occasionally I think when I got the Grosjean rushes I actually because I had the uh, I shouldn't probably say this but I had the on board footage which was never released it's absolutely mind blowing wow. to see him trying to get out of it. it's the reverse on him so it's on his dashboard trying to get out of the car Wow. so that's the only thing I might have Showing the old person before I deleted it. Yeah. God, wow. Jesus, let's hope you'd never have to do that within the game of rugby. No. So t um, tell us what was, what's in store tonight. Are you up on stage and speaking? We've obviously got the great and the good coming down the red carpet. Is I hope this, so. Yeah. I'm doing a Q&A with Finn and Ellis Genge, I believe. Brilliant. So yeah, I hope they don't get across with me and drag me across the stage <laughs> and beat me to a pulp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you probably would fancy yourself against an F1 driver. I'm not sure. No. <laughs> yes. The baby the baby rhino and, and, and Porter. You, would, you don't want to be stuck <laughs> in the middle of that. You don't want to be back as a, as your, in your hooker days as that. No, no, yeah. no thanks. And what constitutes success when, when this sort of gets washed up? How, how do you know whether it's worked or not? Is it get recommissioned. Is that right? Yeah, that's as simple as that. Amazing. So it's, you know, it's a brutal world. It either will or it won't. I'm, yeah. I'm so excited about it because obviously we, we get compliments. You know, if you go back to, um, you know, when we had Stuart Hogg on originally and someone was like, that's best, the best 
we've ever heard him speak. To have people, have players with the freedom without your media manager in the background going, don't answer that question, don't answer that question, don't say that, don't wind them up there. Yeah. That's what I'm excited to see. So people actually get to know the players and it's about the players yeah. more than anything else. And that's that's where rugby needs to go. They need to highlight all those all the positivity and the different the difference in people. We always say how diverse our game is because it needs fat ones, big ones, little ones, fast ones, tall yeah. ones. It needs all the different, it doesn't matter where the background is, you've just got to be able to fit into that team mentality, but you've got to have your own story. And, and that that's what is interesting to me. Yeah, we've got some life. great stuff with like Genji and Courtney Laws in the uh, in the canteen, right, just talking shit. <laughs> and it's just like, honestly, it so goes against the stereotype, you know? Yeah. And that's what exactly what it needs to open it up. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, it does a good job of that. And if series one was about convincing, proving, settling concerns, how much better could Series 2 be? I think it's just about opening it up to more players and going deeper into their stories. And, you know, like Michael was saying earlier about the sacrifices they've made and just what the reality of being a player is. And we've got an incredible episode actually about Negri. Um, and obviously... What a, what a story. Ah, oh, what had. a story. And, you know, to see then him go and, you know, go up against, you know, um, Ellis again and on the back of that tackle and everything else, you know. And But what's really great is we get really good access to his girlfriend and she's like, you know, I'm just not up for that anymore. Do you know what I mean? Please don't put me through that again. And she's like, because I want to get married, I want to have kids. And you could see him, like, he's pulled in two different directions. He's like, but you can't go, you know, it's, it's a contact sport. Do you know what I mean? I've got to commit. I can't play at a half speed. And he's a big guy, right? Yeah. So, um... And listen, you know, he comes out with flying colours, but then he goes into his backstory about where he grew up in Zimbabwe and stuff like that. So he's just, you know, a fantastic character again that, you know, I didn't even know existed before I made the show. And he just humanises these guys. It just makes them come off the page, you know, yeah. and, in a way that needs to happen. So they're there. They're there. They just need the opportunity to tell their stories. The, the kaleidoscopic nature of the emotions that these sports documentaries produce, is, is rugby right up there with the ability to be incredibly funny, utterly desperate, tragedy, controversy, all that kind of thing. Yeah, there's loads of good banter. I mean, that's the thing, again, that I think people don't understand. I mean, the, ep the opening episode, uh, the Russell and Hogg banter is hysterical. That's literally what starts the show. It's fucking funny. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think there is that. Then I, th I think what it's a bit like drive in the sense that when you get to know these guys and then you see them do what they do on the pitch, you're like, holy shit, that guy's now doing that. Right. You know, and it's a bit like when you see Lewis kind of like making music one second and then driving a car at 200 miles an hour and putting it into the wall. Yeah. It's like, shit, you know, it's, it's like, how can you do both? You know? Yeah. So I think it's just that, I think what the world craves and why these shows resonate is because we all see the broadcast version and, you know, we all, I watch tons of football. I watch tons of rugby. I watch a bit of cricket, but you rarely get to see behind the curtain. Right. And when you do see what these people, men or women do, and what goes into the preparation and the sacrifices, modern audiences can't get enough of it because they're craving that access and that reality away from the broadcast. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where it's going. And I think, um, I think the shows, whether I'm making them or not, I think will become more refined and more, um, you know, expert at showing that away from the track or away from the pitch, human side of the story. Brilliant. We hope it's a massive success. And in fact, I think do, do it tends to be not need for it to be a massive success yeah, we, right now. Yeah, we do. We do. I mean, look, the international game is a success in its own right, but we need more more interest to then have more interest in the players to then go watch them where they play week in, week out. Yeah. We, we know the Six Nations is safe, but I just need, I just want the players to be known more for who they are and what they've done. And because we know, you know, having been there, it's not easy. Right. And people just assume that professional sport all, always is easy and it's you you just stroll through it with a smile on your face and that's not all. <laughs> it's far from the truth. Do you, do you get to enjoy the process or is it bloody stressful and fairly uncomfortable? It's not coal mining, do you know what I mean? No, so it's no. not, you know, but it's, um, but no, I do, I do really enjoy it. I'm going to carry on doing it for a bit longer. Um, but it is difficult. Making these episodes work is really hard because, you know, you are to some extent making shows out of bits of access. You yes. know, you can't possibly be in the camp all the time. Um, and, you know, I get that. But so, you know, it's challenging. 
But it's really gratifying when a show lands. Or, you know, listen, even when you kind of think you've made a good episode and it kind of makes sense yeah. and it's compelling and you think, well, somebody might watch that and enjoy it. So, no, listen, it's uh, listen, it's sport. I love sports. If you like sports, a dream, dream gig. And what's next? You mentioned better Tour de France. What, what, is, what is the next in-camp filming? We've, well, we're just editing Tour de France now. We're f- editing golf now. We're doing, I think... The sprint season's finished. I think we're editing that. Um, doing a couple of adjacent things. And then there's a couple that haven't been announced yet. And MLS has just been announced. Or just, actually, we've just started the MLS. Full wow. full swing. Do you, so if you do full swing yeah. as well. That, that's going to be entertaining. How many U-turns has been in that, yes, <laughs> in exactly. that over this, the past season? I yeah. know, I know. That's uh, The politics of that is mad. And I think it might be about to take in Formula One if the rumours are true. In right. that space. Anyway, it's probably just a rumour. Well, there's, there's a little something to leave us yeah. with so yes. after this short break. Good luck. We're really, Thank you. really, really looking forward to seeing it. You followed it incredibly it. closely and I think it's it's about time. I hope it absolutely flies and we will Thank watch you, so the premiere I. with great interest, James. Thank you Cheers, so much. Thanks for, for, for coming time, James. Thank you, mate. Right, just before we finish up, uh, the live rugby this weekend on your telly box, the final round of the Champions Cup this weekend. Every game live on TNT Sports plus the really big game between Sales Sharks and La Rochelle, the defending champions, is also on ITV. So get your telly box on. Monday, the 29th of January. Um, put this in your diaries because Has Tins and I are going to be at the Underbelly Boulevard in Soho for a one off recording of the good, the bad, and the rugby. It is the Guinness Six Nations preview. And we've got the stable in. We've got Ben Kayser representing France. John Fox Davis is up from Wales. Rory Lawson's down from Scotland. And Shane Horgan is over from Ireland. We're going to be talking all things runners and riders. What can we expect from the 2024 Guinness Six Nations? So if you'd like tickets, I think they're only about 200. So quite a limited little number. Think of it as a little question time for rugby. Uh, you can book now at underbellyboulevard.com. Uh, come and join us. We would love to see you there. Uh, we've also got a new podcast in the Folding Pocket Stable as well, which is Football's Greatest, presented by my old Sky colleague, Jeff Stelling. Great to see him in the podcasting world. It sees him talk to some of the greatest players and managers from the Premier League and beyond about the best exponents of the beautiful game. This week's guest is James Milner. His topic is the greatest managers that he's ever worked with and some stellar names are discussed. So Bobby Robson, Terry Venables and Fabio Capello. Here, he and Jeff talk about a memorable moment with the Liverpool boss, Jurgen Klopp. Have a listen to this. Well, he had a lot of faith in you, that's for sure, didn't he? Was he the one who turned you from a sort of out and out, well, not so much a winger by then, but midfield player into a fullback? Was he the first one? Yeah, so... The first time was we played, I think, United in the Europa League and someone had a fitness test the day of the game. We are training at Carrington, actually, which was Man City's old training ground. Yeah. And uh, I remember we were having the conversation and he um, pulled me to the side and whoever it was hadn't made it. And it was me and Kleine, I think, playing. He said, do you want to play left back or right back? And his English wasn't amazing at the time. And I said to him, I think my answer was, uh, that's like asking me which one of these two guys do you want to spend a night with your missus? <laughs> James Milner speaking to Jeff Stelling on Football's Greatest, which is available now. And you can find it wherever you get your podcasts or you can watch and subscribe to Football's Greatest on YouTube if that's your thing. Shall we do a bottle of Black Eye for this week? Yeah, we can do a bottle of Black Eye this week. I think, I think... Even though I didn't manage to get to see a lot, I did read about it. And then at the moment, Henry Slade seems to be doing what needs to be done to get Exeter over the line, doesn't it? Oh, man. Um, so I thought it would be quite nice to send him for a yeah. little... Everyone loves a clutch kick to win a game, don't yes. they? Yes. Well done, Slade. And actually, not just the clutch kicks for the... Uh, uh, Exeter in Europe, but also the fact that he has rediscovered his best form as the Six Nations rolls around. We always talk about Black Eye riding the storms and celebrating the sunshine. Let's hope there's a bit more sun on the back for Henry Slade. So we'll pop a it's bottle it's down to him another reminder Exeter. that uh, class is permanent, form can always be temporary. You're absolutely right. Um, well done, Slade. We'll send one of those down to you. And just a reminder, Black Eye Gin is available at Amazon, selected Sainsbury's and Master of Malt. It has botanicals from every major rugby playing nation and one very special ingredient as well. And £1.50 from every bottle sold goes into the Black Eye Rugby Fund, which is aiming to raise a million pounds a year to help with the areas of risk, research and recovery within the game of rugby union. Fingers crossed dry January is over soon enough. Get your bottle of Black Eye onto the drinks cabinet uh, and enjoy that when it's time to break the seal. That is it for us from this week. Well done, Tins. Nice to have you back. Thank you again, James. We're really, really, really looking forward to seeing you. We've been the good, the bad, and the rugby with our friends at Continental Tyres. We're a folding pocket production, and this episode was produced by Tom Edwards. See you next week. 